Welcome back. We're doing section 17.2 in Kleins here. We want to talk about conjugated dienes. Now, conjugated dienes, as you recall, are uh, composed of two alkenes that are adjacent to one another. And let me discuss how these might be synthesized. Okay. If you have a halogen, you can perform an E2 reaction, say, for example, with potassium tert-butoxide. Okay, and uh, that's your standard uh, elimination uh, reaction. Why are we using potassium tert-butoxide? Because these bases can sometimes be nucleophilic and do an SN2 reaction. So we want a bulkier base to prevent that side reaction. If you have a dihalide, okay, so here we have 2,3-dibromobutane. And we want to treat this with two equivalents of potassium tert-butoxide. So we'll get an alkene on the left, and we'll get an alkene on the right as well. Okay, so that's how we could synthesize this molecule. And before I jump too far ahead, let me just say how you would name this. Okay, uh, going back to the alkene chapter, we name alkenes based on the starting number of the... Uh, carbon, okay? So there's an alkene at carbon 1, and of course the next carbon higher, and 3, and the next carbon higher. So we would call this 1,3-butadiene. Okay, 1,3-butadiene. Now if you have an ordinary cyclohexane, for example, and you wanted to synthesize let's say this conjugated diene, how would you do that? Well, we need to install some kind of handle. In order to do that, we can install a functional group using n bromosuccinimid and UV light. And this will give us a halogen that can be, then be used to do an elimination reaction, okay? So we could treat this with potassium tert-butoxide And this would give us cyclohexene, and we can repeat this procedure again. So remember that n bromosuccinimid and light will selectively do a radical halogenation at the allylic position. Okay, I'll choose the top uh, carbon here, and so we will now draw a bromine at the top carbon. Okay, and then what we can do is treat this with potassium tert-butoxide, and that will give us the second alkene. And the preference here is for those two alkenes to be conjugated or in electronic communication with one another. Okay, so that's how you synthesize uh, dienes very simply in this class. Um, the main concept here is that uh, conjugated dienes are going to be more stable. Okay, more stable generally means uh, less reactive, slower reacting, or gives off less heat. In the textbook, they do discuss heats of hydrogenation. So if you take something like this and you add uh, hydrogen and platinum catalyst, excess hydrogen, of course, you're going to get the alkane and you're going to get a certain amount of heat. Okay. And uh, what I want to try to graph here on this page is the energy scale here on this axis. Okay. And we'll put an arbitrary level here for the energy of this isolated diene. Okay, this is isolated. Now, a conjugated diene, as I have here on an asterisk on the top of the page, is a little bit more stable. So um, I'm going to, uh, you know, kind of exaggerate it here. I'm going to say it's at this level here. Okay. And I'm going to draw a uh, conjugated diene. Okay. 
you know, something like that with the same number of carbons. And if I treat this with hydrogen, excess hydrogen and platinum, you know, I'll get, I'll get the, same, the same product at that same energy level, okay? And what you'll see uh, here is from an experiment, we know that this gives off more heat compared to the conjugated diene, which gives off less heat. Okay. So again, remember, if something's more stable, it's lower in energy, so it has less energy to give off when it becomes hydrogenated. Something that's less stable is higher in energy and gives off more heat when it becomes hydrogenated. So you have questions in the book for example, that say which of these substances would have the higher heat of hydrogenation or the lower heat of hydrogenation or ones that are more stable or less stable. So let me um, take you through a practice problem now. Okay, in this practice problem, we're asked to identify the most stable compound. So again, I'll use my highlighter here to just identify um, the number and type of bonds that are you know, present here, okay? So here's a pi bond, pi, pi. Here's a pi bond, pi, pi. Here's a pi bond, pi, pi, okay? So I'm highlighting the carbon, carbon, pi bonds. And uh, here we want to first analyze if you have any conjugated systems. So all three of these um, pi bonds are conjugated in the molecule on the right. And the very first compound and the middle compound only have two conjugated, okay? So they're slightly less conjugated. Okay, so this one in the middle is less conjugated. This one on the left is less conjugated. So remember, more conjugated means more stable. So we want to identify this molecule here, okay, as being the most stable compound, okay? The most stable is going to have the more conjugation. That's pretty much all you need to know about the stability of conjugated dienes, okay? Now the book does make some interesting comments here uh, at the end about um, this molecule here. This is 1,3-butadiene, uh, okay? And we have a pi bond here and a pi bond here. Now remember, these p orbitals are uh, orthogonal to the plane, okay? This molecule is very planar, as you can see. It's flat as a board, okay? And the p orbitals that make up these pi bonds are going in and out of the plane, okay? In order for these two pi bonds to be conjugated, they have to be coplanar, okay? They have to be in the same plane. If this is twisted 90 degrees, this p orbital that makes up this pi bond and this p orbital that makes up this pi bond are now no longer coplanar and it's not going to be efficiently conjugated, okay? So this confirmation is con uh, conjugated and very stable. This confirmation is conjugated and very stable. This confirmation would still be conjugated, but uh, you can't draw resonance structures that really enable the p orbitals to overlap, okay? So when you look at 1,3-butadiene, okay? Remember that conjug conjugation has to do all with the p orbitals being um, arranged geometrically so that they're all in a line, okay? Kind of like dominoes, okay? So the confirmations that you're going to have are these two here. And uh, notice my use of uh, equilibrium, okay? Now, we call this compound on the left, this confirmation, S cis, okay? And this one on the right, S trans. Now, we learned about E and Z for alkenes, and we learned about cis and trans. These are not cis and trans in the traditional sense that we've learned so far. S, you could think of just sounds, uh, stands for pseudo if you want to, okay? I know it starts with a P, but think of S as pseudo, okay? So pseudo cis and pseudo-trans, okay? These molecules are not cis or trans, they're confirmations. 
there's rotation always around carbon-carbon single bonds in the middle of a molecule, but there's never rotation around carbon-carbon pi bonds. Well, never say never, right? But in these molecules we experience, um, there's not going to be a bond rotation around the carbon-carbon pi bond. Now the S trans is going to be the more stable conformation. And the S cis is going to be slightly higher in conformation due to steric interactions between hydrogen atoms, okay? I'll draw it here on the board uh, with yellow, okay? This hydrogen here and this hydrogen here experience a slight steric uh, clash. So it's been found that the molecule prefers to be in the S trans conformation. And this will become very important when we talk about the Diels-Alder reaction.